These notes are for uh, in, uh, for ISTEM Year 9 Semester 1, but it also would be relevant for the start of um, Engineering Mechanics for Year 11 or Preliminary HSC Engineering Studies. I use the same notes for both. Uh, so what we're going to start off with is SI units, and then we're going to talk about um, Newton's Laws of Motion and Classical Mechanics. And then we will talk about weight and pressure and scalars and vectors and then finally simple machines. So that's what we're looking at in these notes. So uh, it is very important to measure the world around us. Science relies on accurate and consistent measurement. Australia and all industrial nations except for the United States have adopted a standard set of measurements often known as the what system? It starts with an M. Metric system. Prior to the adoption of this system, measurements were based on those used by the Romans, that's right, um, which were both inconsistent and complicated. For example, a gallon, which is a unit of vol volume, it's about four litres, so you can buy a gallon jug and it's, um, anyway, uh, which is a different size in the US and the UK, which is why a 208 litre drum is known as both a 44 and a 55 gallon drum. I, I'm sure that you'd be familiar with uh, this like quintessential uh, drum. Oil is, is measured in drums. Um, the size of those those uh, depends on if you're in the UK or the US because um, they have different measurements. Okay, um, so the standard dimension is or the standard notation is a 208 litre drum. Uh, an example of the complicated nature of this system is the mile is 1760 yards or 5280 feet. If you want to write that in, 5280. I'm not going to test you on that. I only want you to write that down just so you have an idea of how ridiculous uh, the units are. Um, people have to remember, they, they remember, um, what did they do? It's like something tomatoes, five tomatoes, is it, uh, but f five tomatoes. There you go, because you have to say it well, like an American for it to make sense. Anyway, um, 5280. Anyway, or six thousand, sorry, sixty-three thousand three hundred and sixty inches. This obviously makes conversions difficult. Yeah, you have to, if you want to convert between miles and inches, you've got to, you've got to use these unusual, uh, unusual values. By comparison, the metric system introduced in seventeen ninety-nine offers a universal standard based originally on a set of agreed objects. And it's now based on the properties of light and atoms, mostly. Now, I tell people they can cross out mostly because in 2019, uh, the last unit that needed to be, uh, that was still based on a physical object, was replaced with a very, very complicated set of scales. So the idea is that, um, and if you go through these videos, and if we watch, there's a series of videos on Eureka, they talk about how during the French Revolution, they wanted a consistent set of measurements because they felt as though the poor people were getting ripped off because there wasn't a, a standard that people could objectively measure against. So uh, they came up with a meter, and a meter was defined as the distance from the North Pole to the equator run, and the line that runs through Paris uh, because there's multiple lines. And um, in the Da Vinci Code, supposedly it runs through the, the Rose Line, passes through um, Eglise de saint sulpice but I think that's actually not true. Um, that's apocryphal. But that's how they determine the meter. Now, because the world is not perfectly spherical, it's um, it's squashed in the middle, uh, the, so the that doesn't actually make the equator 40,000 kilometers, but it makes it about 40,000 kilometers. For the sake of our argument, that's that's what we started with. There were alternative suggestions. Um, the length of a pendulum that takes exactly one second to um, do a uh, cycle. I, I'm trying to think of a better word for that. Um, when I'm also doing the hand gestures for the class. So anyway, that they, you can't see that because you can't. It's not a recording of the class. Anyway, the point is um, that was very, very close. Very, very, very close. Unfortunately, they, well, they, they decided that um, instead that they were going to go with this value. And they once they determined that value, they then took a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter cube 
of ice water and they said that was going to be one kilogram now in terms of time they did try the uh, they did try to have decimal time they did try to turn the day into 10 hours each with 10 minutes uh, that didn't work out they they went back to the, the most people were pretty happy with time in the, in the end uh, they stuck with they also changed the calendar the number of months in the calendar but they ended up going back with the that um, the second comes from like the Pab Babylonians that's like a really really old value so the day it's pretty easy to to measure accurately so they just divided that up into 24 hours and, and 60 minutes with 60 seconds okay so these days how do you measure those things well we use the uh, the vibration of cesium atoms to measure the second we use the speed of light to measure distance and then mass is now like i say measured by a very complicated set of scales um, if you're interested in that, there's uh, the history of the meter. The world's largest, uh, world's roundest object talks not only about the kilogram, but also the process of people, uh, two competing methods that were trying to be the standard definition of the kilogram. And then this one actually talks about what is the actual, the, the finalized, the one who won that competition. Uh, the Australians at CSIRO, they, they did not win. This system is also simplified as all units are based on seven, seven base units. Uh, I'll show you quickly what those base units are. If we go to wiki, SA. These are the seven base SI units. We really only focus on these three, kilograms, meters, seconds, what we sometimes call the KMS units. Uh, we do talk about amps. We do talk about amps when we talk about uh, Ohm's law and uh, those sorts of things. And it's important to know that Kelvin is the SI unit for temperature, not Celsius. Yeah. So the idea is, um, I, I think I would have spoken about this in greater detail in class, but the idea is if you wanted to say that if it was 40 degrees today and it was 20 degrees yesterday, how much hotter as a percentage is it today compared to yesterday? People would say it's 100% more, 100 hotter. Okay, but what if I told you that yesterday in it was 100 Fahrenheit and today it was 60 Fahrenheit, right? What, how, what would you say there was the, uh, the difference? Yeah, but those are the same thing. They're just different units. So the, the idea is that there must be some sort of universal measure of heat. Now, I do have a Facebook post that I, I link for year 11s on this. Uh, so it's the SciShow. There we go. Absolute zero, where they explain the concept that there is an actual zero degrees, which is um, minus 27 degrees Celsius. And so what, what scientists did is when they determined, I mean, no one can measure this temperature because the act of measuring it would increase the temperature by a little bit. But this te we, we, can, um, we can make a reasonable uh, identification that there is an absolute zero. And then from that, we can just say, well, we're going to call that zero. So that, that, that case, if I told you that the temperature was, um, the temperature today is... 320 degrees Kelvin, or I think it's just 320 Kelvin, you don't say degrees, 320 Kelvin, and yesterday it was 300 Kelvin, that would be actually how much hotter it is today compared to yesterday. That difference, which is 8%, 9% hotter than it was yesterday. So the, the way that we think of numbers does actually influence our thoughts. We can say, oh, it's twice as hot yesterday as, as it was yesterday. Not actually the case. It's actually only 8% hotter because we take for granted that even if it was freezing, it's actually still 200 degrees above the absolute minimum that it could be. Okay, so um, that's been talking more about Kelvin. I generally try not to ask about Kelvin too much in year nine, but the fact that I've recorded in this video means I think it's fair game. Okay, technically, uh, oh yeah, seven base units, larger all... Larger or smaller units are all multiples of 10 of the base units. For some, for example, something is a thousand times larger than the kilogram. Can anyone tell me what is larger than the kilogram? Yes. A ton. A ton. Okay, good. Can you spell it for me? T-O-N-N-E. Exactly right. Okay. The, um, so the, it's the ton and it's spelled T-O-N-N-E. There is also a T-O-N. 
A T-O-N is an imperial or U-S ton, whereas T-O-N-N-E is a metric ton. How I remember that is Napoleon was an um, important factor in the adoption of the metric system. Napoleon, when he tried to take over the rest of Europe, he introduced a set of laws called the Code Civil or the Code Napoleon. And um, that part of that was that all the countries he uh, invaded had to adopt the metric system. And even after they got rid of Napoleon, they still stuck with it. So I think, well, Napoleon has two N's and an E in it. So so does the metric ton. Also, you could think of the double N looks a bit like an M, if that helps you to remember metric. Anyway, I don't care how you remember it. I just want you to remember it. But uh, there's some different ways that you can, there's some mnemonics to help you to remember. Okay. Technically, the official measurement in Australia and most nations in the industrial um, is the International System of Units, or the SI units, which comes from the Système International d'Unité, published in 1960. Not all metric units are SI units. For example, the litre and the cubic metre both measure volume, but which one is the SI unit? So, which one is the met which one is an SI unit? The litre or the cubic uh, cubic metre? Excellent. Okay, cubic meter is the is the correct answer. The liter is a metric unit, but it is not the official SI unit. The the SI unit for volume should be cubic meters. Now you could say cubic millimeters or cubic centimeters. So um, we hear cubic centimeters. If you watch American uh, medical shows, they measure their. Um, you know, I need ten cc's of adrenaline stat, and what they're asking for is ten milliliters because a cubic centimeter has the same volume as a milliliter. Yeah, a cc, a cubic centimeter, has the same volume as a uh, millimeter. Usually, if I wasn't recording, I would play the uh, song Dreadlock Holiday by 10 cc's, better known as the We Don't Like Cricket song. Um, I don't like cricket song, not we. Anyway, um, but for this recording, I will just indicate that. They also have the song Not In Love. Um, which was in Guardians of the Galaxy. Other units, such as the ton and the hectare, are metric, but they're not SI units. Uh, measurements other than um, second for time, they're not units. So, so the minutes and hours, they're metric units, but they're not SI units. Really, SI units should always be measured in seconds. Uh, we just also mentioned Kelvin is the SI unit for temperature, not, cent not Celsius. All units of measurement in this course are derived from three of the base set, um, SI units. Now, that's not entirely true because we did talk about Kelvin, we did talk about amps, but these are the three that I want to focus on. The three main units are the kilogram, kg, the meter, and the second. Other units, such as the gram or the kilometer, are multiples of these units and they're usually denoted with a prefix. Now, for the test, you need to know these prefixes. You need to know what milli, mega, kilo, and giga mean. I really should have said that. Anyway. Milli means, so a millimeter is one thousandth of a meter. It means that a milli means one meter divided by one thousand. Kilo means one meter multiplied by one thousand. A kilobyte has a thousand bytes in it. A megabyte so a kilobyte is maybe the size of a raw text file, a thousand bytes, a short a short text file. Um, a megabyte, well, um, an MP3, a song, might be about somewhere between three and ten megabytes if you download a song. Gigabytes, well, a movie could be in the in the ballpark of a gigabyte. A DVD, if you remember DVDs, they hold four gigabytes. So kilo is a thousand bytes, mega is a million, and giga is a billion, which can also be written with scientific notation. So uh, when I say a billion, once upon a time there was a bit of dispute as to how big a billion is, if it had nine zeros or if it had 12 zeros. This is why I don't use the word billion. Instead, I want you to write the number of zeros, or you could write 10 to the 9, and the 9 indicates how many zeros there are. Please note that the kilogram, not the gram, is the base SI unit for mass. Now, if you go back and watch this video, uh, the world's roundest object. It talks about how originally when the object was invented, it was called the grav, and then there's the dun dun dun, and they say that they didn't like that term because grav sounded too much like count, like as in, you know, 
Dracula the Count. Anyway, they, they didn't like that. They didn't like Baron being one of the terms. So instead they decided to call it, uh, they divided it up by a thousand, called it a gram, and then they realized the gram was too small, so they brought it back up and they called it the kilogram. I hate that the fact that the kilogram is the base SI unit. I definitely see students every year. I see students who make mistakes because they mix that up. Um, we'll talk about that when, with specific examples when we get there. But for the moment, just know that the kilogram is the base SI unit. It's the only one with a prefix in its title. Other units, such as a unit for force. What's a unit for force? Well, um, Newton. Newton. Now, Newton should be written with a lowercase n when you write the word, but when you're writing it next to a number, you write, let's say 10 Newtons, you'd write 10 capital N. And the reason for that is any unit that is named after a human gets a capital letter, but when you write it out as a word, you write as a lowercase, so that way you can differentiate between the person and the unit. Okay, pressure is Pascals. Pascals is lit, written, written, is written as capital P little a, and then when you write the, the word out, you write as lowercase p. Um, or the units for volume, I just said before, what was the unit for volume? Cubic meter, that's exactly right. Okay, uh, and the units for acceleration, for example, are combinations of the units above. So when we say volume, well, volume is a meter times a meter times a meter. Acceleration is meter divided by um, seconds squared, divided by seconds, divided by seconds. The units used before the metric system were introduced by which ancient empire? These are our review questions. Romans. Uh, what are two problems that were solved by the metric system? Yeah? So the two problems with the um, previous system are both start with C. They were com complicated, like Avril Ravine. Yeah, they were complicated. And they were inconsistent. Yeah, so what was the problem they solved? Well, this made them consistent and um, simplified them. I said C, whereas, you know, inconsistent. Anyway, moving on. Which two units? Uh, identify two units that are metric units but are not SI units. Hands up. Cool. Minutes and hours. Yeah, the minutes and hours. Um, let's, someone else, give me someone else. Someone, give, give me Ted. Gram, excellent. Liters is another one, excellent. Okay, so gram is a bit of a tricky one because gram is based on the SI unit. It's just a, a multiple, it's one thousandth of it. Liter, you could say, well, liter has a close relationship. It's actually the same relationship. It's one thousandth of a cubic meter. Yep. Okay. On to our next unit, next uh, section, which is um, mass and force. So what we're going to focus on is Isaac Newton um, developed three laws that describe class, uh, classical mechanics. I guess I'll just read. There are three fundamental laws of physics that describe classical mechanics. There is Now, qu classical mechanics is the world that we live in, the world around us, but there's also the world of the very small quantum theory, which doesn't follow those rules, and also relativity, so Einstein's theory of relativity, right? doesn't or, or they um, proved that newton's laws don't apply for very big things like stars so if you're talking about electrons or photons you need quantum theory and if you're talking about things the size of the star or even satellites traveling around the earth uh relativity starts to come into play but for us um we're going to focus uh, for engineers we're, we're usually working in the classical world and I stem we talk we do we could potentially go to um, quantum uh, quantum theory and relativity but we need to learn to, to crawl before we walk so let's uh, start there if you're more interested in this you can watch a video on the map of physics which describes um, what is considered as part of each of these three domains um, but I'm not going to go into that in this video okay so Newton has three laws and uh, we're going to look at the first law now this first law could be summed up by one word inertia but let's let's read out what the uh, the law. So, the law says an object at motion will remain in motion, and an object at rest will remain at rest until acted upon by a force. Another way of saying that is things are lazy; they won't start or stop doing anything unless a force makes them. All non-living objects could be described as lazy, but don't write that in tests because non-living things don't have personalities, they don't have consciousness or agency. 
Um, another word for this concept is inertia. A rock will not start moving for no reason. Um, if an object was, if a rock was rolling down a hill, it would not stop until it hits the bottom or something blocks it. Right. So the idea is that in space, where there is nothing to stop it, you could throw a rock and it really will go forever. I mean, it will eventually fall into the gravity well of a larger object, but it will keep going until some other force acts upon it. Uh, in a vacuum, something will keep going forever. Now, I have already shown the class some videos on Eureka, and um, it would be funny to show uh, this again because this would be like the third time or fourth time some of these students will watch it, and then you'll probably watch it again in year eleven when you do we recover when we do this this again in engineering. But for now, I'll just say those links are there. I really like the Eureka videos. I do get good feedback. You guys will watch them. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Did you think they were worthwhile? I'll tell you what, they're crazy videos. They're made from the 80s, so they're now 40 years old. The animation is terrible. And yet, everyone I speak to, they're like, yeah, you know what? We did learn something. I maybe didn't like watching it the third or fourth time, but I, I am amazed at how... how, um, how anyway... I don't need to, to, to sell that. You, you can either watch it or not. P p person on the internet watching this. You might consider how a ball rolling on glass, grass will eventually slow down and stop. But this is due to the friction of the ground and the resistance of the air. Without friction, an object moving through space would continue to do so forever. It is difficult to make an object start, or, um, start moving as it is to make it stop. Often large objects are harder to make start or stop than smaller ones. But not always. If you watch the Eureka video, they have an example of a giant cube of styrofoam and a small cube of lead. And they talk about how it's harder to make the lead move than it is the styrofoam because the size is not what matters. The relative ease to make an object start or stop moving is measured by its mass, M-A-S-S, -S, and mass is measured in the SI unit, the kilogram. And then we have a whole video on mass. I have a song which I can no longer play to this class because the staff room downstairs was complaining that they were, you know it was getting too loud. Um, but I have a song that goes uh, about weight versus mass. Bum bum bum. There's a measure of gravity's pull on the object. Um, wait, 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 wait is the do you see what I did there? Wait is the measure of gravity's pull on the object. Mass is a measure of what? How much stuff the object has. Exactly right. Okay, so grams and kilograms, they're the units for mass. For mass. I don't know why I don't have the link to that here. That's a bit disappointing. That really should... Oh, don't worry, it's coming up. It's coming on up. Don't worry, it, we'll, we'll get to there when we get to we'll learn about weight. Newton's second law. Uh, the force of an object is equal to... Look, I'm not going to read that out. Instead, I'm going to say force equals mass times acceleration. For some reason, I tried to use like fancy maths words. Instead, I should just say force equals mass times acceleration. Newton's second law is the easy one to remember. It's also the one I'm most likely to give in a year nine test. I'm not saying that that's what would be in a year nine test, but I'm saying it's the one I'm most likely to give in a year nine test. Okay. The same amount of effort to make... Um, the same amount of effort is needed to make something start or stop moving. The effort or starts with F force needed to move an object depends on both its mass and its change of speed. Okay, so speed is fine. Technically, it's the rate of change of speed, which we'll learn about in a second. Speed is a bit of a funny word. We're allowed to use speed. And later on, I'll say that we, you know, as physicists don't really like to use that terminology. They like to use something a little bit more precise. They like to use the word velocity. But for the moment, what we're going to say is um, that if we compare, if we watch this Eureka video, they talk about how if you had to choose between someone rolling a bowling ball at you or Federer serving a tennis ball into you, which one would you rather? Well... I t which I'll tell you which one is more likely to bruise you, and that would be Federer's serve, right? Sever Federer serving the ball at 200 or whatever, however fast. These days you'd probably say Djokovic. I'm living in the past. But anyway, a, um, a pro tennis player, Serena Williams, right, serving a tennis ball into you is going to leave a bruise. Uh, 
And the, the idea there is that even though the bowling ball is much, much, much heavier, if you're rolling that ball, bowling ball, it's going to be traveling at a much lower speed and consequently it's going to have a um, smaller force. Okay, acceleration is equal to the change in, uh, uh, change in speed divided by time. So I like to use the Greek letter delta. The Greek letter delta, it looks like a triangle. It's actually this symbol down here. The Greek letter delta that looks like a triangle is used to show change. And when we said that acceleration, if I said define acceleration, it's a great question for a year nine exam, define acceleration. The best answer I can come up with is acceleration is the rate of change of speed. Another way of saying that is the change in speed divided by time. Delta V over T. Yeah, that's how I would write it. Yeah, if you wrote delta V over T, I'd give that I'd give that one mark out of out of one. Yeah, the rate in change of speed is probably a better answer. But if you use symbols, if you used delta V over T, I'd give that as correct. Okay, we have two videos on acceleration. The first one just explains the concept of it's actually not the speed that matters, right? It's that when you ride your bicycle, that you never can just start riding your bicycle at 10, 10 meters per second, which is pretty fast speed. Um, that's that's 36 kilometers per hour. We Because we don't like to use kilometers per hour because it's not an SI unit. So we're always going to divide the number kilometers per hour. We're going to divide by 3.6 and we're going to convert it to meters per second. If you watch this video, that will go through that maths. Um, but the fact is, you just can't start going in that speed. This is why when people sell cars, they're very interested in selling your car based on how quickly it ex can accelerate, how quickly that car can accelerate up to the, the desired speed. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to see if I can get to my um, uh, one of my Facebooks. We're just I'm going to pause for a second. We're back on on uh, so on my Facebook. I have some pictures to help people remember things. These are the Eureka videos and um, some links. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second. But in the meantime, what we're going to look at is the uh, Porsche Spider nine nine eighteen. Uh, it has an acceleration of twelve meters per second squared. Uh, now, how we determine that, I, I've gone into you know, the maths of that. I mean, this is probably a little bit beyond the level that we'd normally look at. But car manufacturers, they don't sell their car based on, oh, it's got an acceleration of 12.6 meters per second. What they'll instead say is they'll say that it can hit, um, it can go from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in a certain speed. So the Porsche um, Spider, can, it has the, it, at the time I made this, it held the record. It, that it could hit go from zero to 100 kilometers per hour in 2.2 seconds, which is very fast. Um, so, consider a train that can reach its top speed. And now, this all of this that I'm about to talk about now is covered in this second acceleration video. Consider a train that can reach its top speed of 36 kilometers per hour in 10 seconds. Now, if we can convert that to um, into meters per second by dividing by 3.6. Usually I play Ed Sheeran because he had an album called Divide and I go oh why oh why oh why to remind me that in engineering at least you're always going to be given the kilometers per hour and have to convert to meters per second never the other way around. So that's why I just remember if you remember it's 3.6 and you're like but do I multiply by 3.6 or do I divide by 3.6? Ed Sheeran helps me to remember that. Anyway um Another way of thinking of, is that a meter per second is faster. It's three times faster than a kilometer per hour. Yep. Okay. If a train took, and a way you could think about that is that, you know, rockets are measured in meters per second and they're a lot faster than planes, which are measured in kilometers per hour, as an example. Uh, if the train took 10 seconds to change its speed from zero to 10 meters per second, so this is its top speed, but it didn't start at that speed. It had to accelerate from, st from standing from zero to get to that speed. So let's have a look at the, the train. So it left the station and it's now zero meters from the station in, for, in zero seconds. 
at the end of the first second, it's one meter away. Then it's three meters away. Then it's six meters away. 10 meters, 15, 21, 28, 36, 45, choo choo. And at that point, it's no longer speeding up. It's hit its top speed when it's 55 meters away. But let's take a snapshot at each second. In the first second, the change in speed was one meter. In the second second, the change in speed was two meters, three meters, four meters, five meters, six meters, seven meters. So let's have a look here. That between the eight second and between eight seconds and nine seconds, it went from 45 or well, 36 to 45. That's an increase of nine. It went nine meters in that one second. So you could call it speed in that in that second. You'd say its speed was nine meters per second. The previous second was only going eight meters per second, then seven, then six. Yeah, every second it's increasing its speed by how much? It's increasing its speed by one meter per second every second. Yeah, so therefore the train's acceleration can be described as one meter per second every second. Yeah. The way that we write that, the SI unit can be written in various ways. In this course and in engineering studies, we write that as one meter per second squared, which is one M slash S little two. Yeah. But it's important to know that it can also be written. Uh, and if you, if you don't know what I'm, I mean there, because I'm not going to fill that in one M slash S little two. But in science, it can be written as one M S minus two no slash the instead of the slash you write a minus it's important i say that because sometimes you will see the see both you will see the other version okay now i've got something in bold that means it's important a force accelerate a force of one kilogram accelerating at one meter per second squared is the unit of what a newton which is written lowercase n e w t o n but the symbol is written as one capital N, yeah? Because it's named after a human, it gets a capital letter. Okay, and I've got some review questions. What what does inertia mean? Um, yep. Laziness. laziness, yep, okay. Things like to keep doing what they're already doing. That is the answer I was hoping for. Things like to keep doing what they're already doing, except we don't write that in an exam because um, non-human object, uh, sorry, non-living objects don't have agency or consciousness as to the best of our understanding. I mean, maybe they do. The Australian government had a video about tacos. So um, anyway, why do things keep moving? Sorry, why don't things keep moving? Why do they slow down? If, if they're lazy, why do they slow down? Friction, Friction exactly right. Um, what is the term used to measure inertia? Don't. Okay, um, I can see people. Uh, so, yes, mass, mass versus weight, two measures for an object. They're not the same. Let's find out why. Okay, so grams and kilograms, they're the units we use for mass. For mass, right? It's a measure of how much stuff the object has. Okay, define acceleration for me, please. Go. Delta V over time is a great answer. Okay, can anyone else give me a more wordy answer? Yes. Yeah, the rate of change of, exactly right. The rate of change of speed. The word rate indicates that it's a time. Yeah, the rate of change in speed. Okay. Um, okay, what is the unit of measurement for acceleration? Yes, kind of. Exactly right. Meters per second squared. Meters per second per second is also another way of saying that. Or... Um, ms to the negative 2, to the power of negative 2. What is the term for mass times acceleration? A bit of a clue for that one here. May the mass times acceleration be with you. Yeah, kind of. Force, that's right. Okay, define a Newton. Yep. 
Exactly right. One kilogram accelerating at one meter per second squared. Okay. The third law. This is probably the most famous one, um, even though it's probably, well, I just could say that. Okay, the third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Imagine I had a cannon, and then that cannon weighed, uh, had, it, had a mass, is a better terminology. It had a mass of 1,000 kilograms, a one-ton cannon, if you will. Now, it's going to accelerate a cannonball, right? Another, other people might say the word shoot a cannonball. And how fast is that cannonball? It's going to leave the cannon with a speed or an acceleration of 200 meters per second. The cannon will recoil in the opposite direction. Now, I will have got you to draw um, a picture of cannons with arrows. And I'll say that the force of the cannonball is going to be 10 kilograms times 200 meters per second squared equals 2,000 newtons. So that means that if the cannon is pushing a 2,000 kilogram, a 2,000 newton force on the ball, the cannon is going to have to be forced in the opposite direction with the same force of 2,000 newtons. But because it's so much heavier, because it has so much more mass than the cannonball, its acceleration is going to be a lot lower, only two meters per second squared. Okay. Now, just to prove to you that that is in fact the case, I have a video which happens to be here Funny, you don't really see it there from that from that viewing angle. <laughs> from that angle, you can clearly see it goes backwards. I'll just show you one more time. Okay. Um, now. The reason why it doesn't continue to accelerate is because usually you put a cannon on a little bit of a ramp, so that, that way it will roll up the ramp and then roll back down the ramp. And that's where it returns back to its um, its position. Okay, the cannon will continue to accelerate. It actually won't continue to accelerate. It will continue to move until it's... Um, uh, it will continue to move until it's acted upon by another force. It won't continue to accelerate. Um, Often the cannon will only accelerate for less than a second as the uh, fracture as the friction of the ground resists the force of the recoil. It is possible to fix the cannon in place so that it will not recoil or accelerate at all. For example, by positioning in front of a, a wall, when the cannon fires, the force of the coil uh, the, the recoil will be completely absorbed by the wall. In this case, the reaction the word you're filling in there is reaction of the wall is equal to the force of the recoil. It is possible that the reaction force needed will be so great that it will cause the wall to fail or collapse. Yeah. So sometimes, if let's imagine if I put that next to a wall and the wall was made out of paper, right? A paper wall might not be able to provide a reaction force of 2,000 newtons, and it might break. So generally, the reaction force will increase until it can be until it's equal to the force it needs to provide so right now if i get out of my chair the reaction force of the chair is pretty close to zero when i sit down on it the reaction force shoots up to about i don't know 800 or 900 uh, newtons and that's the idea is that the, if i need if i was really if i had three or four people all stand on this chair and we needed to re instead have um, a reaction force of thousands of newtons that might be enough for it to break the chair. Yeah, because the chair can only provide so much reaction force. If, you, if there's no force, there's no, no reaction. But it will keep providing reaction for as long as it can until it can't provide any additional reaction force and it breaks. Okay. It is the job of engineers to design structures that will ensure that they're strong enough to provide sufficient reaction force to withstand failure. Now, that's a deliberately complicated sentence, but what it says is engineers design stuff so it's strong, so it doesn't break. Yeah? Let's have a look at it. 
that the st object needs to be strong enough to provide enough reaction force so it doesn't break. Yeah. Okay, and here's some questions that you can work on at home. A two kilogram rifle uh, uh, fires a 30 gram bullet at 400 meters per second. What is the force of the bullet? Well, it's going to be the force in the bullet is going to be 30 grams, which is point zero point um, zero three kilograms times 400. And that's going to give you your answer in newtons. Yeah. So don't write 30 times 400. That would be wrong. Right? It's 30 times 400 divided by 1,000. Okay. What is the recoil of the force on the rifle? It's exactly the same. The recoil is, is equal to the force on the bullet. Identify the force that resists the recoil of a cannon against a wall. It starts with an R. Reaction force. What happens if the wall can't resist the recoil? It'll break. Yeah, it'll fail. Yeah, but um, collapse is a good word as well. Okay. Gravity. All objects on Earth are forced downwards with a force uh, with by an acceleration called gravity. Not just a movie with Sandy B. Okay, so this is a bit of an interesting one. There are in physics, in physics, not so much in engineering. In physics, there are four fundamental forces. There's a good video by Kirk Kazakt or in a nutshell, where they talk about um, what is something is what it's called, and it talks about how you could think of the universe as having matter. And when we talk about matter, we're talking about bosons and, and uh, leptons. Uh, sorry, yeah, so bosons and um, quarks mostly. So quarks make up the protons. Um, and then we have things like electrons and protons and electrons and neutrons. They make up atoms. And atoms kind of make up everything. Once you have matter, you then have the rules of the universe. And there are four rules of the universe. We call them forces. There are four rules to the universe. There is the electromagnetic force, there is gravity, there's the strong force, and the weak force. I have an XKCD video that talks about this. Let's see if I can find that quickly for you. Um, we're done with that video. Let's go with forces. What is a force? There's a video on the graph, um, and on the metric system, and metric time. And we're on to acceleration. We'll just see if I can find forces. Weight versus mass song. Here we go. This might be where I have, what is a force? Okay, so um, in engineering, we talk about these forces. We talk about compression, tension, bending, torsion, shear. Ah, here we go. Surely love is the greatest force of all. Um, anyway. There's an XKCD, they're, they're comics for nerds, um, that says that there are four fundamental forces. Um, and this is a teacher explaining that there's gravity and there's electromagnetism, which follows Maxwell's uh, um, equations. And then there's the strong nuclear force, which um, it holds protons together. It's strong. And then there's a weak force, um, radioactive decay. And so that's in a sense. You just mumbled and said radioactive. And those are the four, the four fundamental forces. And then when you put your mouse over the picture or when you go to the website, it says, of these four forces, there's only one we really don't understand. And that's uh, the gravity. Okay. Um, you can go to a website that explains all of these nerd jokes. And, um, you know, they do a pretty good job of explaining these things. So, good website. Um, and if you're really keen, I have stuff that talks about quantum physics and like, so this is about re relativity. A couple of examples. I like to say that um, if someone was traveling at 90% of the speed of light and they went to Alpha Centauri, by the time they got home, it would feel like 10 years had passed. But for the passenger, it would feel like only three years had passed. So if you had a younger brother who was four years, or well, let's let's say a younger brother's two years younger than you, when he came back, he would be um, five years older than you, yeah, because uh, of the relative time travel. I think I got that right. Also, when you squeeze a spring, you are slightly increasing its mass. 
How much do you have to increase its mass in order for in order to be measurable? Well, the bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima would increase the mass of a spring. The energy that was released in that bomb would be enough to increase the mass of an object by one gram. Wow. Yeah. So the point is you know, that, that m equals uh, um, e equals m c squared. Because C is a pretty big number, um, the amount of ma energy that's released from one gram is pretty enormous. Okay, uh, in terms of quantum physics, I have some videos that talk about what quanta is. The idea is that there's the smallest possible measurement of energy. Anyway, none of this is going to be in the test. So if you're interested in this stuff, if you're interested in how uh, photons and electrons behave like waves of probability, which I just think is a great concept, they don't act like waves, the act of waves of probability. Um, anyway, there's some videos there. So Niels Bohr, he won the Nobel Prize for his work on quantum theory. We're going to go back to the nice, easy to understand world of gravity. Wait, except that that's one we don't understand. Okay, uh, there's another video by Veritasian that talks about how gravity is not really a force, and that some people argue that gravity is not really a force. Gravity is just the curvature of space time. Okay. Um, we also have the, this song, the weight versus mass song, the one that we're not going to talk about. I have a lecture from UNSW, but that's really for Year 11 kids. And we have a Eureka video that talks about weight versus mass. Okay, in theory, all objects fall at the same acceleration, but this is not always observed because of factors like wind resistance. So for instance, if we did an experiment where we dropped a bowling ball on a feather, the bowling ball will hit the ground first on Earth, in the air. But if you put it in a giant vacuum chamber, which I have in this video, um, we observe that they do actually fall at exactly the same rate. On the moon, um, the Apollo 16 astronauts or something like that, they did an experiment where they dropped a hammer and a falcon feather, and we, we can see them falling slower because the gravity is slower, and uh, we observe that they do fall at the same time because the moon has no atmosphere. Now, to help you remember... I have a song by Alicia Keys, and to cut to the chase, she says, I keep on falling at 9.8 meters per second squared. Ah, ah, ah. Anyway, um, weight, weight is the term for the force of gravity. In physics, weight and mass are not the same. Not the same, not the same. Mass and kilograms. Anyway, no matter no matter what the rest of the world and your scales might say, your weight is measured in your weight is a force measured in newtons, and it changes depending on the gravity of the planet you are on. And so, in the Eureka video, they say if you're not as slim as you'd like to be, you have a mass problem. You need to stop eating so much, right? Theoretically, you can do some exercise, but that doesn't work for many people. Works for my brother because he like runs you know twenty k's a day, um, but for most people exercise anyway. Just stop eating so much, right? I, I've heard of doctors where you know they were asked to go like gastro um, the ga the gastro tie. What do they call it? We get stomach stapled, and it's like just stop putting so much food in your mouth. I'm like, okay, thanks, doctor. <laughs> I would never have figured that one out on my own. Anyway, but if you just want to lose weight, you can go to the moon. If you go to the moon, your weight will be one sixth of your current weight, and the chair, the chair. If your chairs are breaking, if you went to the moon, your chairs would stop breaking because your weight would be lower. <coughs> yeah, you could design really, really lightweight chairs on the moon. Okay, uh, the hammer and feather were mentioned earlier. Your mass is measured in kilograms and will only change if you change your diet or do more exercise. The SI units are not based on Earth's gravity, so a mass of one kilogram under Earth's weight has a, um, under Earth's gravity has yeah I'm missing the word gravity has a weight of about 10 newtons technically 9.8 newtons in engineering you're allowed to use 9.8 in physics sorry in engineering you're allowed to use 10 right but in um, physics you have to use 9.8 please note so if you do both use 9.8 but if you're a lazy engineer you can get away with 10 Please note that one kilogram times 10 meters per second is 10 newtons, not 10 kilonewtons. That K disappears. Why? Because the SI unit for, for mass is a kilogram, not the gram. Yeah? The kilogram, not the gram. So you can remember, this is a picture of Isaac Newton. One newton equals one kilogram times one meter squared. Whereas this is a picture of, um, I don't know, he used to play football for the Sharks. I don't think he's now a boxer. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, thanks, Gallon. Okay, one kilo kilonewton is equal to 100 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. So we can think of football players. It can be useful to remember that a football player who weighs Paul Gallon, at least the time they made this picture, he did have a mass of um, 100 kilograms. Um, oh, wait, so it's useful to remember a 100 gram apple is one uh, one newton is a 100 kilo, 100 gram apple and a 1 kilogram 1 kilonewton is the weight of a 100 kilogram football player okay i think i can get to this before the bell goes when a football player with a weight of 1000 newtons sits on a chair he or she applies a total force of 1000 newtons on the chair if the chair has four legs well you divide that force by 4 you're going to get one, 250 newtons per leg if the leg isn't strong enough to provide a reaction force of 250 newtons, the leg, the chair will break. It is the job of engineers to design structures and chairs that are strong enough to provide sufficient reaction force to prevent failure. So engineers make stuff that's strong so that it can provide a reaction force so it doesn't break. What is the weight of an 83 kilogram man? What do we have to multiply by? If we know the mass of someone, we have to multiply. If we know the mass of someone, we have to multiply to find out the force or the weight of the person. What do we have to do? We have to multiply them by 9.8 meters per second squared. So roughly, it's going to be somewhere between 800 and 830. I'm not going to get the calculator out. It's probably like 812 newtons, something like that. The moon has a gravity of 1.6 meters per second squared. What would that person's mass be on the moon? Well, you divide by 6. Yeah, it'd be 83 times 1.6. I don't know what that is, but... Um, I don't know. 200 newtons, something like that. 83 times 1.6. Uh, how, do, how do engineers ensure that chairs don't fall? They design them with sufficient strength that they can resist failure. That'll do for today. See you.